Welcome everyone for joining the day two discussion of the seventh Stockholm Security Conference uh, as part of a series of discussion reflecting regional perspectives on the war in Ukraine. Uh, this session we will focus on the reactions from Asian countries and the geopolitical implications for the region. Like most parts of the world, Asian countries have also been unavoidably affected by the war. There are similar concerns among Asian countries that the war might affect the economic and security situation in the region, but the reactions from Asian countries differ to some extent considering their respective national interest. This session will therefore focus on unpacking diverse positions of Asian countries on the war. Um, we, for that, we have five, uh, four distinguished panelists uh, during the discussion for today. And we will ask each panelist to make a seven minute open statement followed by open discussion. Uh, for the audience, please submit your question in the Q&A box and I will feed them to our experts later. Without further ado, I would like to turn to our first panelist, Dr. Jognath Dr. Panda, uh, the head of Stockholm Center for South Asia and Indo-Pacific Affairs. Dr. Panda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Feishu. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in the CIPRI uh, panel. I'm Jagannath Panda uh, with the ISDP heading the Indo-Pacific Center. Pleasure to be here with other participants and it's unfortunate that Dr. Yuan could not join us. Um, let me share my thoughts um, um, on the Asian reaction on the Russia-Ukraine war. I think the fundamental thing that uh, we need to ask here is that what this war has done not only to the Asian politics, but also to the global politics. And I think there, I do see three specific issues that has come to the forefront. One is that um, when we talk about Russia-Ukraine war, we generally see that there is a, a intense divide has happened between the democratic world and the autocratic world. And the Asian countries are very much a part and parcel of this politics. Uh, we, we take the example of India, which is very unique, the kind of position India has taken, being from the democratic world has shown a kind of subtle, um, if not a outright support, but a kind of neutral stand towards the Russian position on the war. Uh, equally, we have Japan and South Korea, we have other Asian countries who have maintained also a kind of a different position in terms of aligning with the democratic world. Um, the second thing that we see at the forefront of this war is that the divide between the West and the global South. I think there was a time when the global South was, you know, trying to um, strengthen its unity and India was a part of this global South forums. And today what we see that this, with this war, the divide between the West and the global South is becoming much more intense. The third issue that has come to the forefront with this war is that we are seeing that there is a serious and intense demand for energy resources, which is continuously rising. And so there is a politics involved with the energy resources. And I think uh, Europe is a part of this. Um, most of the um, Asian countries are a part of this. And therefore, what this war has done, it has actually opened a divided uh, world uh, to the forefront, the democratic versus autocratic world, the West versus the global South, and also the politics involving the energy politics. But I mean, all of this, I think there is one partnership which is coming to the limelight. That is the you know, partnership between Russia and uh, China. Even though there is official statement that there is no limit partnership between Russia and China. But uh, I do personally think that what this war is creating that uh, you know, for the international countries observers to understand the limits of china russia relationship and the limits of china russia relationship is that that probably china does not want that this war to continue for a long time because it is not really a good news for china my second point in my presentation would be that how do i read the response of the asian powers uh, and i think uh, my response to this self posed questions to myself would be that there is no uniform uh, response to this war. I think there is no singular pattern to this war uh, from the Asian countries. There is varied response. And particularly India's position and response to the Russia-Ukraine war has been 
quite um, different and distinct from the Asian powers. And I think um, that has enormous implications for the rest of the Asian countries. And if we talk about the Asian position, uh, India's position and stance on the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, I think there are two things that needs to be understood in India's context. One is that many observers and international you know, um, um, thinkers, they see India's position on Russia-Ukraine war as a somewhat ambivalent and probably uh, rightfully so because the kind of position India has taken in terms of you know, um, not voting against Russia in the United Nations Security Council, probably it makes sense to see that India's position is ambivalent. But I would read it more as a uh, India's position aligned with the India's national security interest. India does not really want to take a position on this war, even though officially India has given a statement that the war should be stopped. So I think India's position on the Russia-Ukraine war is a somewhat debatable issue between a moralistic value and strategic value. And therefore, what we see is that India's position is more aligned towards its strategic value, its strategic interest. And therefore, India looks for a credible partnership with Russia in the interest of energy supplies, energy imports, arms supports, which has been the backbone of India-Russia partnerships. And therefore, India has maintained a tactical neutrality on the world. And my last point here is, and I think what this in, um, war has done to the Indo-Pacific politics, and I think there are three issues that we need to take into account. One, I think this war has opened a new gateway for Europe to reach out to the Asian countries via Indo-Pacific, or um, um, it has actually brought closure, the European regions closer to the Indo-Pacific regions. Today, we have seen that most of the European countries are actually showing a lot of interest towards Asian powers in terms of having a more credible partnership with India, with Japan, with ASEAN countries. But most interestingly, Europe is now looking at the entire Indo-Pacific region in a new context after the, after the war. And I think that is certainly a positive development. The second development, I do see that probably, even though I do not personally see that NATO is going to be expanded to Indo-Pacific or NATO is going to be expanded to the Asian continent, but I do see a new frame of alignment happening between the scope of NATO uh, and the scope of Indo-Pacific um, mineral uh, frameworks that is particularly between Quad. So there is a synergy emerging between NATO and Quad to you know, cooperate even though this cooperation might not be really in an official format, but there are areas of scope of cooperation might happen. And this war has uh, you know, triggered to that. My last point is that I think what this war has also done, it has created a divide between Eurasia and Indo-Pacific. And therefore, what we also see that the Eurasian politics is becoming much more interesting today. And uh, we saw that, you know, many of international observers and scholars, they try to write off the significance of Russia, India, China trilateral. But what this war has done, and with India's position, that probably there is an enormous significance attached to the Russia, India, China trilateral forums. Um, so therefore, what we need to take into account that Indo-Pacific frameworks are at one end, whereas there are many Eurasian frameworks which are also on the other hand, for example, Russia, India, China, Trilateral Forums, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where India is a member, AIIB, which is also having India and Russia and China in that, uh, you know, multilateral forums, including the, you know, uh, the BRICS formulations, which is also a part of the Global South, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa Forum. So I think what this war has done is also created a divide between Eurasia and Indo-Pacific. And India is a part of both the worlds, so both the Eurasian politics and Indo-Pacific politics. And therefore, this is an interesting facet of the, uh, for, for Asian politics. So therefore, I would conclude by saying that there is no particular uniform pattern that is visible among the Asian powers. What we are seeing, a diversified response, a unique position from the Asian countries, and India's position is certainly uh, very unique and distinct from the other Asian powers. I'll stop with these uh, initial thoughts and remarks and probably, you know, welcome your comments during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Panda, for your presentation uh, on 
representing a Indian perspective uh, on this issue by uh, mentioning about the divisions, not only, I guess, uh, between the Asian countries, but also more generally on the world, in the world. And also you're mentioning about uh, the changes have brought to the Indo-Pacific politics. There's a lot of things to unpack in, in this uh, rich presentation, and I hope we have more discussion during the Q&A session. Uh, with that, I would like to turn to our next panelist, uh, Professor Zhao Huasheng, uh, a professor at the Institute of International Studies at Fudan University. Professor Zhao, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So just uh, as I told you that I was wrong, that I think what I need to do is just prepare a speech. So I prepared a speech and uh, I didn't but expected that this is a kind of uh, round table. So, <clears throat> so however, I uh, will make my speech as short as possible with the permission of the anchor. So my uh, uh, talk is a perspective on understanding China's policy towards the Ukraine crisis. So like for most of countries, outbreak of conflict between Russia and Ukraine was a shock for China as well. And so there's no need, I think, to go into detail about China's reaction and position here, because it's, uh, uh, it, it is uh, officially stated many times. Uh, we know the uh, that there's a view in the West that China should clearly draw the line with Russia and join the West in opposing it. In fact, there are various views even among us. However, the view in favor of continuing to develop relations with Russia is mainstream. I, uh, in this regard, the most representative argument is that the one that takes US China Russia relation as a plan, uh, planetary framework? It argues that even if China sides with the US, it is unlikely to change the US policy of continuing China. And the end result of China doing so can only be neither a real improvement of China Russian relations, but also at the expense of China Russian relations. And uh, I think this argument is too strong to deny. The United States sees China and Russia as common adversaries and implements a dual containment policy against them. And this is reconfirmed in the new US National Secret Strategy Report released uh, in, last, in last month. So, and such circumstances are asking China to support the United States in its fight against Russia looks strange, I think. But, uh, however, what I would like to share with our audience here is my perspective on China Russian relations. My personal perspective, I can speak on behalf of China and the government of China, and I uh, can uh, speak on behalf of the other scholars. My perspective is to take state relations and its regularities as a starting and ending point in understanding the logic of China's policy. The Ukraine crisis has thrown the, wor thrown the world into violent turmoil and turned international politics upside down, but a close look reveals that the basic pattern of state relations has not changed significantly. It has been adjusted, but not completely disrupted and reorganized. Countries that were friendly with Russia remain friendly, and few non-Western countries have sharply changed their positions. And those who are anti-Russia uh, are basically Western countries or countries with closer relations with West and no Western country has changed its stance. I think this is not a coincidence. 
Similar situations are common in international politics, and it shows that state relations are complex systems that is influenced by a complex of domestic and international factors, with bilateral factors being particularly important. From this perspective, I think there's nothing special about China's policy towards China Russian relations after the Ukraine crisis broke out. It does not differ significantly from the behavior patterns of other countries in similar situations and is in line with general regularity of state relations. Many countries have taken stands similar to China, for example, India. China has been paid particular attention, mainly because it is too big as a great power, and the influence of sino Russian relations is too significant. Needless to say, sino Russian relations are very friendly. And uh, it is widespread among scholars of West, and not only in West, to see the US fact as the determining fact in sino Russian relations. But from China's, uh, from my perspective, the meaning of Sino-Russian relations for China is much broader. Sino-Russian relations have a special place in China's neighborhood security. It's one. And significance of Sino-Russian relations for China, China's peripheral security is not only in the border area between the two countries, but it plays an important role in the maintaining security and stability of the entire Northern Chinese periphery, F2. And three, against this background, that China's greatest strategic pressure comes from the sea, good Sino-Russian relations can ensure that China has relatively stable strategic rare in case of a major strategic crisis from South direction. And the four, Russia is the main partner in China to drive, build a fairer and more just international order. And uh, five, the Taiwan issue is the biggest challenge, strategic challenge China faces. The last thing that mainland wants is to have to implement reunification by military means. But mainland has to make preparations to rise scenarios of situation. So it can be predicted that if there is a war in the Taiwan Strait, China will be in extremely severe and hard international environment. And in that situation, international understanding and political support is very important for China. And next, Russia is the largest export of oil and one of the biggest sources of natural gas for China. And uh, Russia could play a unique role to China's energy supply and, and energy security. And then, seven, China Russian relations are not only an uh, uh, important, very important component of structure of world power relations, but also a critical framework for China's regional cooperation. But without cooperation between China and Russia, a lot of regional mechanisms and organizations that both China and Russia take part in will uh, maybe continue to exist, but uh, could be slack. And uh, there is one very important, why stable relations are very important for China. That is, in the, all the history of sino russian relations, there's no record of maintaining long-term friendship and close cooperation. And counting from 1996, when the two countries declared strategic partnership, the sino russian strategic friendship has lasted for 26 years. It is the longest in the 400 years of history of sino russian relations. I think all the experts know the very sad history of China-Russian relations of 1950s and 1960s and 1970s. So up to that period, it took China and Russia 25 years until 1989 
normalize their state relations. And now seven years until 1996, raise their raise them to the level of strategic cooperation. So a reversal of Sino-Russian relations would be at the cost of 20 years of strategic partnership and the sad history of Sino-Russian relations in 1950s, 1960s would be repeated to some extent. And next, I think that good Sino-Russian relations is not only in the interests of China and Russia, but also contributes to international and regional stability. With Europe and Russia already in a fierce confrontation, a deterioration of Sino-Russian relations would plunge the entire Eurasian continent into a state of turmoil and uncertainty. And I, uh, uh, it, uh, should, uh, China adheres a policy of non-alignment and does not want to forge blocks and block confrontation. So China's policies and ideas will also be reflected in and affect Sino-Russian relations. So that I, I believe Sino-Russian cooperation is not a fact that stimulates confrontation on the country. It contributes to international balance and stability. It should be emphasized that taking state relations as analytical framework is not to remove its value orientation. In the Ukraine crisis, China insists on to respect and safeguard sovereign, uh, so sovereignty and territorial integrity, to respect of the legitimate sacred concerns of all parties. China promotes peace talks insist on to resolve the crisis through peaceful means and firmly opposes the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, finally, in conclusion, keeping stable state relations policy is not an exception for Sino-Russian relations. It applies to all of China's bilateral relations. China did not break down relations with the US when the US launched the Iraq war on false grounds, attacked Yugoslavia, bombarded Chinese embassy in Belgrade, and killed and wounded Chinese diplomats. Today, the United States imposes, imposes containment and sanctions on China and presses hardly on issues involving China's core interests. And even so, China wants to improve its relations with the United States and Europe. Russia has not done so much things to China. So why China should not maintain normal state relations with Russia? Thank you. I'm sorry for, uh, I, I speak a little longer than uh, I suggested. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Um, so you uh, mentioned about your own view of uh, on the perspectives on uh, China's uh, politics towards to Ukraine war and also more broadly the logic of China's politics in uh, Sino-Russia relations. And you mentioned, you highlighted that the China-Russia relations is much broader and have a lot of con different content and different aspects in this, including the importance for China's uh, peripheral security, um, energy security, and they mentioned about the importance of the regional mechanism, which was a, which are a, lot, a large of them was based on the cooperation between China and Russia. And you have also highlighted your view that a good, re, good China-Russia relations will contribute to the stability of the entire Eurasian region. Um, so thank you so much for your rich presentation. And uh, with that, I would like to turn to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Iskander Akibayev. Yes. Uh, oh, well, once again, thank you very much for CIPRI for this great event. And it's, I am very honored to be part of this established group of experts. Um, first of all, I'm also would like to emphasize that I, it's, I would like to speak on my behalf, not from on behalf of my institute. So in this respect, when we're talking about the, the crisis and the military activity, which is happening in Ukraine, um, I believe it's actually uh, at some point uh, one of the steps in the chain of bigger uh, global fragmentation 
uh, for some people, for some experts, they claim it to be the, the age that, that we're living in. Uh, it reminds them to be a part of this kind of 19th century when there was a global powers and then there was a regional powers and, for, uh, and they tried to test the status quo uh, where the turmoil and this kind of sense of uncertainty is rising. So I think we are at the eve of something even bigger in the respect that uh, the international system is, is uh, reloading uh, as a cycle in, in, in its own way. So uh, I, I believe that the great powers and medium and small powers should really take care and attention to what's happening in this respect. Um, on the second front, I believe that uh, uh, the, the international institutions in general sense uh, are at some point of kind of uh, stagnation uh, in the sense that they should have been more proactive and more, uh, have much more say in preventing this, such kind of conflicts or wars around the world. And uh, what's happening in Ukraine certainly is one of those examples where the failure uh, of international institutions to deliver uh, their, um, their actions uh, is uh, in some kind of limited. Uh, the, 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 the situation in Ukraine actually at some point raised up a new level of militarization or military narrative is raising up, even among the um, pacifist countries. Uh, it's become clear that conventional and asymmetric, conventional weapon, uh, weapons and army, uh, the effectiveness of armies becoming much more important and it's not outdated narrative and uh, uh, countries, small, medium or big, pay quite big attention. And we, we can expect that the military expenditure expenditure of countries will rise up in this respect. And uh, uh, hopefully it will not lead to the arms race in any different directions. But at, at this stage, I believe it's uh, one of those aspects that we need to pay attention. Um, for, uh, as I'm coming from Kazakhstan, we share one of the longest, with the longest border with Russia, 7,000 kilometers border. And with Ukraine, we have a very strong and historical ties being part of this former Soviet Union, etc. cetera. And, uh, uh, for Central Asia as a region, uh, which uh, certainly uh, has own view on what's happening and has been always proposing this multi-vector foreign policy where uh, uh, countries in this region tried to be a, to have a constructive relations with the Western countries, with, a, with Asian countries, with Russia, with China, etc. Because we have to, it was only way how we could actually uh, uh, survive in the early uh, 90s and now to constructively cooperate on international level. So, but at the same time, uh, specifically speaking about Kazakhstan, our president speaking at the St. Petersburg Forum this year has clearly stated that uh, even so we have a very good strategic relations with Russia, but we do not recognize uh, uh, this uh, uh, deal there. Uh, republics, uh, because we do, we usually abide, we always abide by the uh, United Nations Convention, and uh, in this respect, we uh, cannot agree with the Russian position on Ukraine. So it was an official state, uh, uh, and in many areas, it was uh, it was understandable from Kazakhstan side because it was a, pre a predictable and gradual uh, position of Kazakhstan on many issues uh, related to the territorial and integrity. And for our case. We believe in our foreign policy, we push uh, put very big uh, emphasis on the uh, the integrity of the territorial uh, integrity of the state, and the borders are kind of a sacred point uh, in our foreign policy stance. Um, I believe uh, what is constructively can be done in this situation where there's so much uncertainties and the uh, there's so much. Uh, uh, black swans in the sky in the international security arena. Uh, I, I, I think that small and medium states can play a bigger role in this in this situation, where they can have a much more say, uh, specifically from the standpoint of neutrality. This concept should be actually uh, reinvigorated and reconsidered in the new uh, context, where uh, it, whether it's in international organizations, whether it's uh, in the uh, negotiation platforms. So in this respect, Kazakhstan has provided a number of negotiation platforms, be it on Syrian talks, uh, be it on the Iranian nuclear program, uh, uh, in the Organization of Islamic Conference, and etc. So in this respect, I think it's Kazakhstan can be one of the showcases where a medium, a medium 
state state can pro, uh, promote its diplomacy in alliance uh, with uh, uh, eager nation uh, who would like to actually uh, uh, benefit from the conflict resolution. Uh, and we see that uh, the, the war in Ukraine and situation in Ukraine directly and indirectly affects us in the respect that uh, we see uh, the, the, the recession and we see the sanctions uh, which are affecting also our economy and uh, the food prices and uh, uh, food security is also one of those points where we are actually directly linked. And we try to uh, mitigate those risks, but at the same time, we are certainly uh, interested in the, 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 the fastest resolution of this conflict. So uh, there is certainly a big question of which, what kind of world we are going to head in. Uh, are we going to have a fragmented world? Are we going to have a more kind of new Cold War 2.0? Uh, are we going to have many different blocks uh, with their own ideology or kind of uh, uh, foreign policy interest? So it's a big question for the expert community and uh, the government officials around the world who uh, may be watching this conference just to ask the question. But uh, in my opinion, uh, we can only uh, solve and make sure that we are not will enter into this kind of uncontrolled uh, conflict narrative where it will not end uh, good for all of, all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, for your country and your region is much more really uh, on the front line and in con connected with this war and has got, as you mentioned, directly and indirectly affected by the war a lot, uh, including uh, the sanctions on the economic recovery from the pandemic and also, of course, the food supplies and energy supplies. Uh, with that, I would like to open the floor for uh, Q&A. Um, as a as a as a moderator, I think I have the privilege. Uh, so I would like to take that and ask the first questions to be to all the panelists. Uh, so just a, a very general question. Um, what are the uh, in your view, what are the repercussions of the Ukraine war for your countries or more broadly for your the sub region? Uh, and then another question maybe is that um, even how have the positions in your countries have shifted since the breakout of the war? Um, which panelists would like to address it first? Um, is it, Kendra, can you start with this? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I think it's a very relevant question. And uh, uh, for, in general sense, speaking about Kazakhstan or Central Asia, well, well it's, if we speak about Kazakhstan, we understand that uh, the supply chain of uh, the supply chain in general sense has changed, and uh, we need to reconsider our uh, economic policies, uh, export policy, import policies, uh, specifically in the energy sector. Um, so, eighty percent of our oil was passing through the Novorossiysk uh, uh, point uh, in Russia, and uh, uh, with this uh, sanctions policies, uh, we understand that um, it's. Uh, quite a uncertain, uh, th th there is so much uncertainty on the, the what's going to happen next. So uh, uh, there was a, there was an argument about for diversification. Specifically, there was an argument for uh, building up the alternative routes for exporting oil and gas oil uh, through the, the middle corridor, so there's the Caspian Sea. And I think uh, that's a very important uh, task for the uh, Kazakhstani government in general sense. Food security is also an uh, important aspect because we are also wheat producing and wheat exporting uh, uh, country and we have to utilize our position in this respect and that's why we need to build up a new roots and I, I think that's why uh, uh, this even uh, our connection with uh, within this Belt and Road Initiative is very much important because Kazakhstan is a, a landlocked country, and uh, we try to focus on the, our transport and transit roads, where China plays very very much important role. And uh, uh, those roads are going to through Kazakhstan to Europe, and we need to focus on that as well. Uh, so there are many actually aspects and angles how to look at the uh, the influence and effects specifically from the economic side, because it's 
uh, directly influence like, the quality of life of ordinary people and the state economy in general sense. Thank you, Dr. Panda. I think uh, this is an interesting question because a lot of um, changes has happened not only in India's point of view, in India's perception, but also in the regional perception. One is that I think if we talk about the war, um, I think in India's view, um, which has a problem with Pakistan and China for a long time, now India has taken a strong note that you know the war is um, is, is a sudden uh, development. Uh, if we take the le uh, lessons from the Russia-Ukraine war, that a, a war can be, you know, uh, outbreak at any time. And I think this suddenness of facing a war and its consequences uh, is a serious lesson for India and India's experience uh, uh, all this while. The second is that uh, what India or many other countries in the region are taking a strong note of is that this kind of war is not going to immediately end. So the end game to this war is not going to be anytime soon. So I think that is also going to lead in many policy perceptions, changes in the policy perceptions. And particularly when we talk about the outcome of the war, the result, uh, which is not re really in any definite sense that there is no clear winner and loser in this kind of war. So the war is going to continue here and uh, the countries are going to have uh, economic implications out of this war. The other issues is that the governance issues, the range of governance issues that this war is giving us and which is having some sort of repercussions on Indian foreign policy. One is the energy resources, uh, even though we know for a, for a fact that India is purchasing a lot of oils and energy um, you know, imports from Russia, but again, what this war has done is that it has uh, triggered India to look for energy diversification plan. And I think that is one critical element which is being clearly visible in Indian foreign policy today. The other aspects are like the food security, the supply chain, um, where India is a critical element, is a critical country in the Indo-Pacific regions. What this war has also triggered to India is that India cannot really be taking side to a particular frame of countries. Uh, so therefore, India would like to, you know, uh, kind of uh, keep its policy options open. And that is the biggest uh, lessons that India is learning. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, implications are visible in Indian foreign policy as a result. The last point I would like to mention is about India's position, which has changed. I think what this war has done is that, you know, it has constantly reminding India that there is no permanent enemy and permanent friend in international politics. And therefore, even though India has a age old boundary dispute with China, what this uh, war has done, it has made the thinkers in India and thinkers in China to realize that, you know, a kind of boundary dispute between India and China does not have to be a constant and continuous process. I think, I think both sides are realizing that probably to having a continuous continuous dispute and continuous tense ties is neither in India's interest nor in China's interest. And therefore, there has been some subtle changes in bilateral perception, um, uh, India's perception towards China and China's perception towards India since the outbreak of Russia-Ukraine war. Even though I don't really argue that the boundary dispute between India and China is going to fizzle out and the tense relationship is going to stop all of a sudden. But there is a certain realization on the part of China and part of India that a permanent and you know continuous rivalry between India and China is not really in the healthy of the bilateral relations and for the peace and stability of the regions. So there has been a positive overture from both the sides, even though the boundary dispute is certainly not going to fade away and uh, we don't really think that China and India will find a credible solution to the boundary dispute all this while. So there is a subtle change in happening in the perception, even though this perception is very temporary in nature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Zhao, would you like to address any of the issues? Yeah, I, I'm aware shortly. For the first question, the uh, reactions and influence of the Ukraine crisis on the region. Uh, particularly for China, I think that there are 
sure a lot of impact or sales impact on different areas of uh, the region. Uh, firstly, has to stabilize the region, not only a uh, small region where China and Fantasian states are located, but uh, all uh, the Eurasia continent. And uh, uh, after the day, there's still a great threat and possibility of escalation of the war. So it's a serious challenge. And there are a lot of talks about the possibility of outbreak of the new world war. So this is a very serious uh, situation. Uh, second, for China, economically, I think it's uh, not good for China's plans, for example, to promote the initiative of one belt, one road, and uh, politically for China's build of uh, together with other states to build a community of a uh, with the shared future of uh, mankind. Okay. And uh, particularly, I think it just makes China's relations with the United States and Europe even uh, worse than before. Although China maintains the same policy uh, as before to try to promote friendly and cooperative, constructive uh, relations with the United States and Europe and Ukraine including. And uh, uh, this is, uh, there are a lot of other uh, impacts, sure. I can't uh, name it uh, all of them. And second question, China, how the uh, formation of China's policy. Uh, China takes a very independent position in uh, the crisis and, and make independent policy. And uh, according to China's expression, it's just by the fact and objectively justly perform its uh, policy. This is, and uh, my understanding that the major points of China's policy is first, respect sovereignty and uh, territorial, territorial integrity. Second, all the uh, sacred concerns of all the parties should be given uh, attention. And uh, third, uh, I mentioned already that China like uh, uh, promote uh, peace talks between the two parties. And uh, China like and insist on to solve, resolve the problems through mean, uh, peaceful means. And uh, finally, China opposed the use of nuclear weapons. And uh, China, this is just a policy of stance. The major point, as, my, uh, as I understand, of China policy. And uh, for a long run, uh, the final solution for the current of Europe, or the relation between Russia and, uh, and uh, its neighbors and uh, European states, is to form a balanced and uh, overall uh, security institution that uh, meet interests and concerns of all the parties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to uh, ask Clark two questions. And one question is actually to Professor Zhao again. How has the response, including military support to Russia's invasion in, in Korea uh, in Ukraine, affect China's assessment of the Taiwan questions? Uh, another question is to Iskander. Uh, how has the war in Ukraine been perceived? Uh, in how is the public opinion in in uh, in Kazakhstan on the war of Ukraine? Uh, maybe we can start with Iskander first. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, this. Uh, 
there were different opinions among the public. And uh, this certainly, uh, there was a big question uh, because there is a strong uh, historical ties with both countries, with Ukraine and Russia. And both uh, Ukrainians and Russians who are citizens of Kazakhstan are living here. And in this respect, the, the, we see different opinions on that matter. But at the same time, we saw uh, uh, a rallies for, uh, for peace and uh, or, or rallies for uh, support of Ukraine here. And there was NGOs who were sending humanitarian aid for, uh, to, to, to Ukraine from Kazakhstan. So in this respect, we saw the different sentiments but in general sense, uh, we uh, people were heading towards uh, the uh, voicing out for the, the peaceful resolution on and prevention of the conflict in general sense. But uh, and that was, I think, the, the the only way how we could approach that situation. But we, but at the same time, we we saw different views on that as well. Thank you, Professor Zhao. Okay. Uh, people uh, like to talk the Ukraine crisis when you see it together. Actually, they're quite different, totally different issues. And uh, from point of point of view of history, from point of view of political. Uh, uh, circumstances or background. I mean, for example, all most absolutely most of the countries in the world recognize Taiwan as part of China. And uh, from legal point of view, so they're quite different uh, issues. So I do not think they uh, compare Taiwan issue and Ukraine issue uh, as proper as a problem. And uh, maybe there's only one similarity that is both of the uh, object, both of the issue are used against uh, one party or one country. Right. Um, is that I would like to ask the third questions i think it's to all the panelists uh, it's about arms ex arms export and the military expenditure uh ha has the war in ukraine affected the, the military spending uh, in your country and maybe the way of how you may spend the uh, expenditure uh and uh, since uh, uh many countries may rely on the russians arms exports uh, for example, in, in this case, India, uh, how may that affect India's calculation in this uh, context? Um, Dr. Panda, would you like to go first? Thank you very much for that interesting question. I think uh, what the Ukraine war has uh, taught us is that this war is not really unidimensional. It's not really a military conflict, as it appears to be. I mean, of course, this is a longest tenured military conflict war that is happening. Um, on the ground. But then there are also other aspects to this war. There are cyber war angle, there are, you know, um, war on the energy politics, uh, which is uh, intensifying from time to time. And also on the governance issues, as other panelists pointed out about food security, energy security and all. So it's a war which consists of different angles. So therefore, when we're talking about military spending, um, many countries, including India, is factoring that it's not only a hard work uh, kind of a war or a military oriented war that one has to prepare for. So the military spending today is having also additional account. And therefore what we'll see is that many countries, including India, will factor drawing lessons from this war that any kind of war, any kind of military purchase or spending has to also have additional component that we have seen major powers military spendings, particularly we have seen in the case of US and China's military spending, but not probably in other Asian countries, but this war has come as a uh, ready-made lessons for many countries, including India's military spending. When it comes to arms imports from Russia, I think India for the timing will like to continue importing and purchasing arms from India, because we know for a fact that India's 
military establishment still having the equipments from the Soviet Union period, and to have that kind of uh, replace that kind of um, you know military equipments and infrastructure, it will take time. So today, India is actually importing uh, you know almost sixty percent of its arms and ammunitions from Russia, and that will take almost more than one decade to replace those uh, arms and equipments. And today also. What uh, this Russia-Ukraine war has uh, done to India is that India is also looking for diversifying for arms and uh, you know uh, ammunitions, uh, ammunitions imports from other countries. So as a result, we are purchasing from U.S., purchasing arms from you know Israel, from France. So there is a diversification of arms import is coming, you know, happening in Indian context, and that will certainly you know trigger the military spending. Uh, in years to come, and we'll see that probably uh, you know many countries will follow the same route as far as the military spending patterns patterns in India uh, and in the Asia is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Iskander. Well, um, I think this uh, certainly affected Kazakhstan, and uh, we see what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, etc. So many countries are drawing their own lessons, uh, not only on the military spending in general sense, but uh, on, the, on the military tactics and military doctrine, uh, what kind of war we or military conflicts in the future that just yes, in case it ha might happen. Uh, we, so those countries are need to be ready uh, in any case. And certainly in Kazakhstan, we have been following the path of modernization of our army and uh, we just passing some uh, uh, legislation so on the uh, changing or modifying the military doctrine and uh, there are so many aspects of the the, 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 the war these days it's we see what's why why drones are becoming much more uh, important than or just like tanks on the ground so there are different aspects of hybrid war etc so uh, uh, this uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine and the conflict situation certainly affected our perception of a military or army as a, as a concept and certainly the 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 defense uh, forces should be uh, updated in this respect. Thank you. Professor Zhao. Uh, although I'm not expert in this uh, area, but I guess that China's uh, formation of the uh, military budget is not directly related to the Ukraine crisis. Um, but the question is real, particularly for other uh, parts of the world, especially for Europe. And uh, so uh, there's a possibility to stimulate to, uh, the military expenditure competition in the world. This is a, a Generally speaking, it's not a positive actor for reducing military expenditure in the world and military competition. Thank you. Um, the next question is about uh, the effect of the war, the domino effect of the war. Um, so in your perspective, will the war lead to a destabilized security situation in Asia, for example, in South China Sea region. And also there has been a lot of discussion about different blocks and maybe a potential Cold War 2.0. So what will be your take on, on this issue? Um, maybe Dr. Panda you can go first. Thank you. Again, uh, very interesting question and very futuristic. I think um, there will be some uh, implications and effect on the Asian geopolitics, particularly on the disputed on the ground. South China Sea is one of those issues. But my take would be more on the Taiwan issue. I think the way the Taiwan issues is involving, uh, evolving from time to time, and what we saw um, you know, um, uh, with Nancy Pelosi's visit, I think uh, here I would uh, like to probably uh, you know, put my argument in order by saying that the Taiwan issue becomes a more prestigious issue for the Chinese Communist Party and for Xi Jinping for the timing rather than the South China Sea. Yes, South China Sea is more important when it comes to the energy quest. But again, uh, Taiwan issue has become a party prestige for the Chinese Communist Party in China. And therefore, 
I think um, uh, there will be an intensification of politics happening on the maritime issues, um, as well as the you know land corridor issues. And therefore, what we'll see that probably not really uh, you know a kind of a Cold War 2.0, but also a kind of an extension of Russia-Ukraine war to a hard war, uh, you know, hard kind of war, a physical war happening at in in not a very uh, distant future, maybe a near future. But I I think one point I would like to reiterate here is saying that the war has many dimension, uh, and we should not be short light short sight here by saying that you know the same kind of war is going to happen on the Taiwan issue. I think China is drawing serious lessons from the Russia-Ukraine war and therefore there will be a different tactics probably be implemented on the Taiwan issue and therefore this tactics might not really be one dimensional towards the Taiwan issue entirely. It might be linked with the South China Sea issue and therefore what we might see probably China going for a incremental militaristic approach by occupying small islands in the South China Sea regions as well as in the cross strait uh, uh, regions. Um, and therefore, we'll see probably all of the small islands that the Chinese would like to occupy first before going for a military invention from Thai on, on Taiwan. So therefore, China is drawing heavy lessons from the um, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. They are not really trying to put the Taiwan issue in the same old assessment framework. They would be drawing lessons. There are operational lessons. There are militaristic lessons. There are also consequences in terms of, you know, other uh, side implications that is arising from this war. So therefore, I would like to tie up both the Taiwan issues to some sense with the South China Sea issues. And therefore, we, I will argue that the China would like to have a a uh, much more incremental military approach, even though in the their target to occupy Taiwan might be very short duration, five to seven years, but uh, there might be an incremental military approach instead of a military, outright military invention on Taiwan. Thank you. Professor Zhao. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the first question on uh, the general situation decretification in Asia. I uh, think it could be, the impact could be positive or negative, depends on what lessons we learn from the Ukraine crisis. I may, we, I mean, United States, Europe, and other states, not only China. So if we, continue the policy that to interfere the situation of uh, uh, domestic affairs. And uh, if you promote block uh, confrontation policy, if you take the other states as a target to fight against, as could be the situation could be transformed in some other uh, forms, and it can happen in, uh, in Asia. On the contrary, if we learn lessons from this crisis, that we should not, we should obey the international law. We should respect each other. We should respect the interests of each other. I think it could be positive. And uh, just my colleague, uh, said a lot of, out of Taiwan issue. Just I mentioned above that the last thing the mainland want is to buy military for, uh, means to implement reunification, or also as legal. Uh, it's a lot of things. And I believe there could, could, could be no war as possible uh, it could be no war in Taiwan Strait without foreign support and interference. That's my uh, and uh, there's another question uh, related to this question, but I'm uh, not quite sure and I don't understand very well. That is, after the Cold War, a lot of our people, our scholars 
they say that the Cold War finished in Europe, but it, it doesn't, doesn't end in Asia, especially in, in East Asia. But as a matter of fact, after the Cold War, after the end of the Cold War, the major conflict, military conflicts happened in Europe, Yugoslavia and uh, 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 Georgia, and uh, for example, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and uh, Ukraine, and a lot of. But uh, we used to be think that East Asia is the most dangerous region. But for at least for the past a couple of decades, war didn't happen. Why? We should think about it. Uh, I think China's role plays a very important part in maintaining security in this region. We can talk about it in detail if we have time. The China doesn't involve in any conflict. China doesn't like to promote any part of the region to resolve uh, uh, their problems uh, through military means. And China doesn't involve in military conflict with other countries, even though we have the, there is problems of uh, uh, between them, for example, between China and Japan, between China and India, between China and South Korea, and so China don't like to use military forces. China uh, uh, insists on uh, negotiations, peaceful negotiations, uh, with uh, and resolve this problem with negotiations. So even though there are so many time, so many problems, but there are no war in this region in past sec, uh, second decade. So that's the, I think, important role of China. Thank you, Iskander. Well, um, the question was related to the East Asia, even so I uh, do not represent that or coming from that region, but I spent uh, several kind of you know, living in Japan and Singapore. Um, I can say that from the, the fabric is that certainly um, the, the region is very much vibrant uh, in, if we're speaking about the, the East Asia or Southeast Asia in general sense. Uh, in terms of the population and about, about uh, in terms of the, the economic potential, um, certainly uh, the, the rise of the, it, this Ukraine situation uh, opened up uh, a Pandora box or the world and Asia in general, in specifically, and um, the perception of international security or the military or self-defense is, has, is, has been changing. And uh, we, we, we can expect that the conflicts uh, on the local regional level are still possible soon, but um, I still believe that there are so much interconnections in the in that part of the in that part of the region, specifically in East Asia, and there's so much economic interests uh, linking China and India with the other countries, where it's certainly stemming from the 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 next uh, big thing is, which is going to be most likely a recession in 2023 uh, on the global level, and uh, we didn't recover fully from the COVID-19 and. Uh, there is a strong economic downfall in many countries and uh, the, the economic is moving quite slow compared to other years. So it's a big uh, rational question whether it's uh, how much we're going to uh, dare to move into this kind of very costly activity at the conflicts in a military sense. So for developing countries in East Asia or Southeast Asia, it's very much a big issue, I think. And uh, I believe it's uh, even, if, if there might be some conflicts, it can be more on the skirmishes on episodic level, but I mean, I don't believe that it's going to be a full-fledged or kind of kind of big proxy uh, conflict in that region. Thank you. Um, since we only have eight minutes left, I would like to just collect the last two questions together and also ask the panelists to have a brief uh, reflection on those questions. 
Uh, the first question will be, how would a NATO expansion to the Indo-Pacific affect the geopolitical situation in Asia? Uh, and the second question will be, do you see any of the Asian countries play a role in conflict mediation or resolution given their special relationships with both Russia and Ukraine? Dr. Van Den, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I think, uh, let me first address the NATO expansion question. I think, um, let's be very clear. There is an urge to expand NATO to Indo-Pacific, but it is not going to happen. There will be practical hindrances to NATO expansion. NATO is aimed to look at the only specific regions here in the transatlantic regions. It, it does not have a mandate to go into the Indo-Pacific. NATO's constitution, NATO's charter does not really talk about you know, expanding or addressing the issues in Indo-Pacific. So that is the first hindrance. The second is that when we are talking about an expansion of NATO to Indo-Pacific, who are the countries are going to be involved in this expansion process? Whether the NATO's mandate is going to be expanded or the membership is going to be expanded. That is going to be another debatable issue. And I don't think any of the Asian countries outrightly would be interested to join an expanded NATO, except probably Japan, which is an alliance partner of uh, US, or let's say, you know, the other countries who are the partners, uh, alliance partners of the US in from Asia. So therefore, NATO's expansion has its own limited agenda. Uh, and third, uh, the bigger issue here is that when we're talking out, uh, about an expanded NATO process in Indo-Pacific, there will be structural you know, limitations. When we're talking about NATO per se, NATO has a headquarter, it has a budget, it has a defined charter. But when we are talking about expansion of NATO to Indo-Pacific, can we have an, a charter which talks about Indo-Pacific security? Can we have a charter which will have its own budget to look at the security or military oriented issues in Indo-Pacific? I don't think that's going to be very feasible in near future. We have a quad form in Indo-Pacific which constitutes uh, US, Australia, Japan, and India. And we know for a fact that quad is not really an alliance exercise or an alliance framework. It is more of a loose framework. It's more of a alignment based framework. It is not really among the alliance partner. India is not an alliance partner of the US of, of Japan or in Australia. On the other hand, what we have seen, Australia and Japan are the alliance partner of US. So even the quad is there in Indo-Pacific. It's not really based on an alliance structure. So when we're talking about NATO expansion to Indo-Pacific, it would only be possible if we are creating an alliance structure in Indo-Pacific. And I don't really see that's happening uh, given the you know, budget limitations, given the you know, charter limitations. About the second question about the Asian countries playing a mediating role and resolution, I think the best Asian countries which could be possibly playing some uh, mediation role at this moment probably is India which is a leading country. And India has a good uh, official relations with both Russia and with uh, Ukraine. And India could possibly play a mediation role and possibly um, given the you know, uh, good rapport of Prime Minister Modi with President Putin, this is possible. But then we have seen that when playing a mediation role comes, you know, many countries fall sought in in terms of playing that role effectively because of the you know uh, because of the war situation because of the no compromising form formula that actually both sides employ uh, those who are at the loggerhead of the war for example in this case in russia and uh, ukraine neither of the parties are willing to compromise and there are many other countries who are indirectly supporting this war to continue so therefore i think the role of a mediating actor becomes very limited including of india and i think if we take uh, instance from the history india tried to play a mediation role in the korean peninsula in the korean war period but eventually india failed to stop the war uh, between north korea and south korea so i think we 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 take the lessons from the uh, war history and here even though many countries including some of the asean countries who possibly could play a mediating role um, you know, in terms of diffusing role or some of the Central Asian countries as our, you know, colleague from Kazakhstan was point, pointing out, um, you know, uh, there are some Central Asian countries who could possibly play a mediating role, but their role and mandate is very limited given the war kind of situation currently, which is at the logger. Thank you. 
Thank you. We only have three minutes left. Please be really brief. Uh, Iskander, please go ahead. Well, uh, I certainly uh, would like to focus on the, the mediation. I, I, I agree with uh, Professor Panda and uh, his remark that certainly war has many dimensions and there are the many interest stakeholders who has maybe different interest in this uh, situation and war in Ukraine and crisis which is happening. And so the, the, the room for mediation is quite limited and we certainly need to understand where this mediation goes for. And uh, Turkey, India, uh, Singapore, uh, Kazakhstan in this respect, the, all the partners who actually can have a say in the, in, 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 in the different context uh, where they, they can play a facilitative role. But certainly we need to understand that uh, that it's uh, 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 it's not just uh, uh, a resolution. We at some point maybe just need to focus on the give, providing a platform and then allowing them to have informal kind of uh, channels, back channels of communication in this respect. Thank you, Professor Zhao. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, it's not difficult to find mediate, mediate state. Uh, if if it has good relations or normal relations with all the parties, including Europe, the United States, all the parties accept it. But the most difficult problem is very, very difficult to find a general ground for negotiations. That's a problem. And, uh, and current situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we certainly see a much different picture in Asia than in Europe. And I guess I assume, I think the, the war of Ukraine is part of, you know, the changing economic and security situation in Asia. But there are also so many other factors uh, affected the situation there. Um, there is still so much to unpack uh, in terms of the long term implication of the war. And we hope we can continue this discussion, discussion in the future. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, our panelists, for the fantastic insights and the audiences for joining us for a dynamic debate. Uh, please join us again in half an hour for a discussion on the perspective from Vienna region on the Ukraine war. And you can find the link shared in the chat. Uh, have a great rest of the day or good evening, uh, depending where you are. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.